Well, Jackie, welcome back to Job with Julie. Always a joy to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I think the first time I interviewed you, you kind of shared your whole story, your testimony. And a lot of people are familiar with your ministry and your story. But I thought, I, I thought even as I was preparing for our conversation today, I don't really remember how you came to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to share that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was October 2008. I was in my bedroom and I was watching MTV or something really unspiritual. <laughs> and I felt God speak to my heart um, and say that the girl that I was with would be the death of me. And I kind of did this interrogation of where that thought came from. Um, and because at, at the same time that I had the thought, I felt convicted of sin, which was weird and odd, mm. right? And so I started to think through if God was talking to me. And then out of that, I started to process everything that I loved and enjoyed. And I was comparing it with what I knew about scripture and Jesus, which was, oh, I am a weed head, which is an idolatry, like that sin, because I remember they taught me that. I love watching porn. I know that sin because that's lustful. I'm disrespectful to all authority figures, that sin, like all of my Bibles, all of my uh, Sunday school stuff was bubbling up and kind of like convicting my conscience. And I started to see that me being a lesbian wasn't actually the biggest thing that God might have had issue with. Like I saw that my entire life um, was bad. Hmm. <laughs> Do you hear these beeps? Yeah, I hear them, but they're not bugging oh. me. Okay, yeah. let me turn it off. I, I just saw that like everything that I loved and enjo enjoyed really, really deserved judgment. And um, so I started to have this conversation with the Lord and I told him that I don't want to be straight because mm -hmm. I thought that God coming for me was God also wanting me to be a straight woman. And I really sensed that the spirit of God was leading me to say, like, just come to me, just come to me. And so I told the Lord, I said, I don't know how to do what you're calling me to do, but I do know enough about you to know that you'll help me. And I remember John three sixteen because they drill that into you in Sunday school, which is for God so loves the world that he gave his son that whoever, whoever, including me, believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And I believed, I didn't know I was believing. I just was assenting to what I thought the scriptures were saying about people like me, which mm. is that Jesus died for people like me. And the next day I went to work, I went to Wendy's and I was a different person. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So even as you're saying that you had, sounds like a whole history of Sunday school, Bible teaching, you grew up in that environment. Oh, so my aunt Merle was a believer and my mother worked weekends. And so there were, there are a group of weekends, probably till the, till I could stay home by myself. So I started staying home by myself fourth grade, which I don't know how my mother had that much courage. But <laughs> before then, I would be at Aunt Merle's house on Saturdays and she would take me to church with her on Sunday. And so it was just being around Aunt Merle and being under Bible teaching that just, I just retained it. And it really did a doozy on my conscience. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. had really sounds like a direct encounter with God. So it wasn't that somebody shared the four spiritual laws with you or said, no. yeah, it just, God just confronted you. Yeah. Cause at that point, Christians or the Christians that I thought were Christians, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, they avoided me. Hmm. Um, and I think because at, by this point I'm, 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 I'm projecting kind of this masculine image. And so like, I'm sagging my pants, I'm wearing boxers, I'm wearing sports bras that flattened out my chest. Like I, I looked like a very little boy because <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like 18 or 19. And I think, I don't think Christians knew what to do with me. Yeah. And so I think the Lord in his grace, he didn't, he had to bypass them and just get to me himself by the power mm -hmm. of spirit. Yeah. What a testimony. And yeah. I don't know that Christians still know what to do with you uh, <laughs> because Jackie, you are known for just like really bold speaking the truth uh, yeah. and people love it. And I'm sure some people don't like it um, right. because you just say it out loud. And um, 
your walk with God is so intense and your commitment to truth is so apparent. And I just wonder, like, how did you get to that from that place of in 2008, giving your life to the Lord to being at a place where your walk with him is so deep and your commitment mm. to truth so firm when that's not the story of every Christian. Yeah. God has been really kind to me because he's given me a multitude of counselors. Mm -hmm. And so I got saved at 19. I got connected to a local church immediately. Um, and by immediately, I mean, within that week, I had a conversation with somebody about what God did to me in my room. That person got off the phone with me and repented, gave their life to the Lord. They shared that with somebody, that person invited them to church. And so it was probably five days after I gave my life to Jesus that I went to a church and joined it. So I was immediately planted into a community, right? Um, in that community, I don't know if it was the most discipleship oriented or even gospel um, centric community, but one thing they did have is love. And they showed me through their love for me that God also valued me. Right. Because I have I've been a part of this community that feels devalued by Christians. Mm -hmm. But now God has planted me in a community that values people. And it's like, oh, like God does love people and sees people out of that. I got connected to a ministry in L.A. where I moved to L.A. for two years and got discipled by a woman named Santoria. And it was Santoria that rooted me really deeply in spiritual disciplines in praying and reading the Bible when I wake up. She was like super Christian, so she didn't have cable. Like all she <laughs> had was like Christian movies, like fireproof and stuff like that. And so even though it was a really like, how do I say, a really sanctified, sacred season where it wasn't all of this stuff to do, I think that really rooted me. And why are we here? Why do we exist? What does God want? What does discipleship look like? What does it mean to walk by the spirit? What does it mean to put to death the self? What does it even mean to use your gifts to glorify God when the gifts make you feel good about yourself? What does it mean to actually acknowledge the fact that you love praise and love glory? How does that, like it was in my life in Santoria's home that I think has completely like informed the way I do life now. Mm -hmm. So she was asking you all those questions? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Because I would see it. So I remember that when I started doing poetry and enjoying the praise, and I remember she was the one who challenged me to say, when a something goes up on YouTube, right? Why read the comments if the comments are not going to serve your heart, right? Like mm -hmm. read what God has to say about you. And so it was those little small like disciplines that kind of like was helping me process stuff. I remember even she told me once, she was like, it would be interesting if when you get to heaven, the Lord shows you all the angels that helped you write your poems. Wow. It's like, dad, that's yeah. harsh. Yeah. Do I think the angels helped me write poems? No, but I do think it showed me that God is using you. So, so, that you are a conduit. You are not the source. Mm -hmm. And so all of that worked yeah. together for my good. Yeah. Boy, what a gift. And how long were you in her home? Two years. Two years. Yeah. Okay. Straight up discipleship. Yeah. So you, and she's still around. Yeah. She's still yeah. discipling you, asking the hard questions? No, we've transitioned out of the discipleship to friendship phase. Okay. That's uh, good. But if, if she sees something off, she's quick to, to point it out. Yeah. We all, we all need a friend <laughs> like that for sure. Yeah. yeah. You uh, recently published a devotional and you started out the devotional by saying, I don't like devotionals. Uh, be, can you explain why? Um, they can seem a bit shallow for me. Um, and some of that might be personality. Some of that might be, I just kind of prefer things that make me think things mm -hmm. that make me go below the surface. Um, and I think, uh, uh, not all, um, but some contemporary devotionals just have a way about it that just doesn't feel heavy, doesn't feel meaty. And so I've just avoided them for that reason. Now, like Oswald Chambers, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Spurgeon, I think even one of the uh, one of the Ortlands, I think it's Dane. He has one on the Psalms like those. Those do it for me. And so for me, I wanted to write what I wanted to read. 
which was something that you wake up to and feel like it was sufficient, but not necessarily sufficient, that it was full, but it pointed you to God in such a way where you wanted to be satisfied in him. Mm -hmm. But I I track with you on that. I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. I like Mm -hmm. um, the deep meaty stuff. Uh, You know, even as you're talking about investing in your relationship with God and waking up every day with praise and scripture reading and meditation, in my season of life, that's probably easier to do because I am now an empty nester, Mm -hmm. which you someday will be, but not for a while. You have four little ones. And one of the questions that I often get from, from people in your stage of life is, there's just no time to feast on God. Like there's no Mm. time to invest in my relationship with God. I feel like all I can do is snack here or there. Um, Mm. Can you speak to that? Mm. Snacking isn't bad. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think there are seasons of life where that's all you have room or margin or space for. Mm -hmm. Um, When my babies were babies, like when they couldn't sleep through the night, I could not fathom the idea of waking up early to read the Bible Mm -hmm. because I've been waking up all night, Jesus. I was (laughs) was up every two hours to give somebody a a, a bottle or to change a diaper or they exploded and I got to pull the one. And then you got the older ones who need your attention in a different way and they have to go to school and they need homework. And it just didn't, it didn't make sense to me to even be able to, to be disciplined in that way. But I felt a grace from God as communicated through some of the women in my church where it was like, I'm in a season where if I listen to a podcast while bathing somebody or listen to the audio Bible while driving somebody to school or pray while I'm feeding the baby at 2 a.m., God sees that. And I mm-hmm. think he's honored by that. It reminds me of the the the, the woman who gave uh, a little bit of money and Jesus says she gave out of her lack. Yeah. I think some of us, we're from a place where we don't have the freedom, but we're giving out of a lack. And I think God sees it. But then it was probably a year ago where I, I really felt like the Lord saying, okay, everybody's sleeping through the night. There, There's a consistent rhythm there. You have more to give now. Mm-hmm. And so now it's not about lack. It's about just choosing, mm-hmm. choose to get up early. And that's what I've had to do. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and everybody's sleeping through the night, but you still have a one-year-old. Uh, your kids mm-hmm. are how old? One, three, eight, five, three, one. Okay, so mm-hmm. that's still busy, exhausted. The first thing you said to me when we got on this call was that you're tired. I am tired. So, um, how do you give yourself grace, but yet still say, "Hey, I, I need to be mm-hmm. investing in my walk with the Lord." I honestly think. A fundamental part of the grace is knowing that imperfect devotion doesn't change God's love for me. I think that's important, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because it was a long time where I I really felt like God's love for me was contingent on how good my prayer life was or how often I gave you know, how, how long I sat in the Bible, if I looked at the Hebrew or the Greek. And that's kind of like, that 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 carries a lot of shame, mm-hmm. a lot of weight. And it, it also makes time with God, not a delight, but a duty, purely just duty. Right. And it was when I had, a, when I started to learn what grace meant, and that if I am in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation there is delight like that this like justification has practical implications even on my devotional time that god loves me in jesus that nothing separates me from jesus that freed me up to see it as like i have to do this for god to love me and so it gives room for flexibility Mm -hmm. where if one day i get up and i have 30 minutes in the scriptures and i have this really good prayer time god loves me or if i get up and i have five minutes in the scriptures and 10 minutes of prayer god loves me that does not mean we don't have discipline that does not mean we aren't regimented but it does mean that like man there's room there's liberty for how you show up with god Mm -hmm. so it can even be another form of legalism where you're like Mm -hmm. uh, i have to invest this time in this way and mm-hmm. I, I like that about your devotional because it, it is sh- a short read, but it does give you at least one concept out of the scripture yeah. to meditate on. And yeah, um, yeah I, 
as I was reading, I don't know if that answered your question. It did. No, it did. Yeah, that's it did. good. Yeah. I'm flexible. Is what yes. I'm basically trying to say. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> okay. And you give yourself grace and receive the love of God. Which, yeah. Yes. When I was reading through your devotion and even thinking about the fact that you don't like devotionals, most devotionals, uh, the scripture that came to my mind is in first Timothy and it describes the times that we live in. I don't think anybody would, would argue with what Paul says that there's going to be these terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, yeah. proud, boastful, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, mm -hmm. slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. He keeps going, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yeah. And here's here's the phrase that I think is really important, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And uh, it seems like in American Christianity or Western Christianity, there's a real temptation to have a form of Christianity, even to have mm -hmm. a saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ, where we're not walking in the power of God. And yeah. uh, and we're reading maybe devotionals that are, are keeping us skimming on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me your thoughts just about what you've observed in that in our current Christian culture. Dr. Slattery. Yeah, that's a. Uh... That's the thing yeah. here. And um, it also, I think that might be the same book where Paul says that they will creep into households and get weak-willed women right. who are always learning but never coming to a knowledge of truth because they are burdened by many sins and slaves to their passions. That's exactly so, what it says next. Yeah, there. I think that's a part of the form of godliness is that we go to the conferences, we read the devotionals, we do the Bible studies, we listen to the podcast, we do all the things, but we don't surrender our passions. We, we're we not applying or believing what it is that we've learned. And so we're not actually walking with the power that is available to us in Christ Jesus. And I, I really think that people are satisfied with being casual Christians. I do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it... I think it feels easier. Maybe if it doesn't feel as heavy on the conscience to say, yeah, I go to church and yeah, I do all the things. And yeah, I might be have some pride here and some ego here and some lust here, and some witchcraft here and some uh, licentiousness here and some sexual immorality here. But, you know, like God loves me. There's grace. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and it, 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 it goes against even what Jude wanted us to contend against. We're supposed to contend against this idea that God's grace is licensed for sensuality and sin. And we've we rebelled against legalism and fundamentalism. And rightly so. But we rebelled against it and with a whole other way, which is like, no, I can I don't have to be as holy. That's extra. That's extreme. That's self-righteous. That's this. And it's like, no, but what if it's Christianity? Hmm. Yeah. To cut your hand off because it's causing you to sin. What if that's discipleship to take up your cross daily and die? Like, what if that actually is the way to live if you follow Jesus? And so that, I, I just, I don't know. I just, I think it's comfortable for us and therefore we do it. Yeah. And uh, in that same letter, Paul keeps going and he says that they'll gather around them a great number of teachers who essentially say what they want to hear. So yep. you can listen to the podcast and read books who reinforce a shallow Christianity and mm -hmm. who won't call us to repentance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and can I, can I say something? Yeah. I wonder if one of the problems is like we notice like it's it's a blindness but it's a blindness to glory you know like if you just see dying to cutting off as getting rid of all of these good things and not see them as actually not being as valuable as the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus then i can see why you think hypocrisy is actually satisfying but if you see God as God and therefore as good and worthy of glory, like if you really do see him as valuable, then you see that cutting off the hand or gouging out the eye is good because yeah. I get him. And, and so that's that's kind of been part of 
that's been the motivation for me. Like I've had issue with John Piper. I, I really have of, of things that he said, but one thing that man has done for my heart is give me a view of God that is so high that it makes all the sacrifice worth it. Hmm. And maybe that's what we got to get back to is just a, a higher God view in our preaching, teaching and communication. So what you're saying is when we settle for shallow Christianity, we're actually missing out on something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. Yeah. <laughs> we're missing out on the best. You yeah, know, special. Yeah. I was trying to communicate this actually to one of my sons about six months ago, and he was really wrestling with, you know, what am I going to have to give up to follow Jesus? And I picture my life as being like boring and, you know, like I have to deny myself and I was trying to give him a vision of like, was Paul's life boring? Now I can say, is mm -hmm. Jackie Hill Perry's life boring? You know, like yeah. we all want that passion of waking mm. up with a burning purpose for life and with the glory of God. Uh, and it requires the things that you're mentioning. It requires true repentance and mm. being willing to pursue the hard message and, and take it to our heart. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we get there? Jackie, I mean, I know this is part of your own walk and my own walk. How do we make sure that we're pursuing that that hot place with the Lord and not settling for a shallow Christianity? It's so not a 12-step program mm. to, <laughs> to loving the Lord. Um, I think about the woman at the well and how Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And I think a part of that message that we missed is she didn't ask him for what she needed because she didn't know who she was talking to. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's in knowing who she's talking to that she recognized the need and therefore asked. So I, I think having, having a high view of God which is, let me read this Bible and learn about who he is. Okay, how does the book begin? It begins by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wow, okay, he made everything. <laughs> he's all powerful, he's all great, he's all good, right? And so therefore he made me for himself. That's a big part of it, is that if I'm, if I'm not living for him, I'm not even living for the reason I was made. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of a thing. So then that discovery shows me why. Why am I not living for the reason? Like, why am I not living for God? Oh, if I follow the story, I see that there's these two people who God made and they sinned. Oh, so I'm a sinner. That's the reason I do what I do. So let me keep reading to see how to fix this problem. Oh, well, I can't keep the law. Well, I can't, I can't kill all these lambs and horses and do, do all the things. Oh, he sent Jesus. <laughs> like in John, he is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So I need him. So that's how we start to do it is we discover who is he. He made me for himself. I cannot like meet his standard. I do not want him, but I need him. Please help me and give me your living waters. And so that's the thing is the gospel, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we need to rehearse the gospel and believe it again. And yeah. believe it again and again and again and again and again until we die. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you started with Genesis. And mm -hmm. the reason I call that out is because I think a lot of us want to start with Matthew. We want to start with the New Testament. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and some people know every other year I read the Bible through a year mm. and then I take, do you, yeah, do you follow do. A, pl a plan? I do. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So my husband and I do that every other year and we kind of like share notes and stuff. And then in the off year, I'm like, okay, I just had a buffet. I want to go back to the okay. books that really captured me and dig a little That's deeper. Cool. But right now we're like reading through the, all the prophets Mm. And no one wants to read that. Like mm -mm. no one wants to read Jeremiah and Lamentations. And, mm. but it's like, what do we miss about God when we just read Paul's letters or just read the mm. gospels? Mm -hmm. Man, the prophets, I've really resonated with them lately. Um, and not just in the act of telling people to stop worshiping idols and stuff. But more so the humanity of living in a society 
that doesn't seem to like mesh well with your own life like even jeremiah like mm-hmm. i'm like this dude is out here having to tell the truth consistently and nobody believes him and the frustration of that and the 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 insecurity that but him being honest with god and then god continuing to remind him i've called you i'm with you and be faithful. And so I think I think that's one thing that we miss is the humanity of the prophets, not just the rebuke, not okay. just the idolatry, not just the sin, but even their place within like God's bigger picture. It just, mm-hmm. I don't know. I resonated with that a mm-hmm. lot lately. Can you relate to it? Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, because I've been in Jeremiah, I was in Jeremiah last week because my relationships are shifting and changing like as i've become more serious about jesus friendships that i had when i wasn't as serious about jesus aren't working anymore Mm -hmm. and that hurts Mm -hmm. right it hurts to to be like oh man like being faithful to you has has relational consequences Mm -hmm. and i was like let me read jeremiah so i can be encouraged by him yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. that's a, a good way to look at it. Let yeah. me dig into that just a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. You even mentioned a few minutes ago, John Piper, like you said, there are a lot of things I don't agree with him on. Here's what I learned from him. Yes. Relationships in the body of Christ seem to be fracturing all over the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm sure Jackie, I can't think of what it would be right now, but I'm sure if you and I talk long enough, we could come up with some things that we disagree on and probably mm-hmm. passionately disagree on. Yeah. But Jesus put such an emphasis on unity as the sign mm-hmm. of him being our savior. What yeah. does it look like to navigate those kinds of differences in the family of God, including in friendships, like you say, where there's sometimes we do have to walk away. Hmm. Man, it, it it really is hard. I don't even know if I've figured it out mm-hmm. yet because it, it kind of feels like a day by day, case by case situation. Um, I, I think one is we are not naturally gracious people. Well, I'm not. So I'll, I'll just say I, I, I can I can be very resolute. So if I have landed on a thing and I see it as true, it just is what it is, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's given me a, a I'm 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 much more cautious to make a judgment call on people because I know that's my temperament, right? Like and so there's a need for grace there. But there's also an awareness of yourself that says we're all growing. We're all in process, right? And so that has given me a flexibility to say, just because they land here today doesn't mean they'll land there forever. Or even if they do, will I still love them? And so I don't know. I I don't know. I just think we're not good at patience and love and grace and all of that all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I suck at it, but I'm trying. (laughs) Yeah. And and, you know, that's, that's part of the sanctification process. When I read the scripture, like that stuff jumps out at me. Yeah. Even what I read in in First Timothy, like part of the evidence of that shallow faith is, you know, that we're slanderous and mm-hmm. uh, and there's dissension. Yeah. Um, but so. you know, you know what, Julie, Doctor Slattery, I've also been trying to practice this because it was something that I found myself teaching people. That I was like, I actually need to do it, which is I need to pray for what I see. Mm. I need to pray for what I'm irritated by. Yeah. And I've noticed that the more I pray for it, the less visceral the feelings are. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, cause I think we're noticing things on social media. We notice things in our pastor sermons. We notice things in our friends that irritate us or bother us that make us angry. And some of it is, is, is a righteous anger. Right. But I think we're feeling and reacting more than we're praying. Yeah. And so what if we prayed more? I think that is a function of love that also like it 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 cultivates compassion that maybe we're just missing mm-hmm. um sometimes. Mm-hmm. So what does that practically look like for you as you return to that? So practically is I've been very irritated by the amount of self-centered preaching that I see on social media and I am very tempted to just go in and vent and talk about it 
And I realized that I was venting privately so much that it was making me dislike people. Mm -hmm. Right. And I felt like the Lord was like, but you haven't prayed for them once. Mm -hmm. You're noticing all the planks in their eyes, but you're not praying. And so that's creating a situation where you can't even discern correctly because not all of your emotions are involved. And so I've been putting in my prayer list on my phone different teachers to pray for so that I'm not just calling out or critiquing, but I'm also putting them before the Lord and saying, God, please draw them near. Please correct their teaching. Please put wise people around them to help their heart. Please, like if they have any greed, pluck it out. Like like pleading before the Lord instead of just criticizing. Oh, That's a that. really practical way. That's fantastic. I love that yeah. example. Yeah. Um, that example, as well as, boy, so many I could point to that you wrote about in your your devotional show that you like read this verse of scripture and then mm-hmm. you come out of it with this very practical application to real life today. And mm-hmm. I, I think most people don't have that experience. They read a verse of scripture and uh it doesn't it doesn't cut their heart. It mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit doesn't use it to show them this is how this is meant to teach you and correct you. How do you, how do you do that? Like, I'm I'm sure some of it's personality, your gifting, but God wants to use his word on a regular basis to change us. Mm. So Mm. what's the process of that? I love this question. Yes. Some of it is gifting because I, I'm a, I have the spiritual gift of teaching. And so there's a sense in which I can see and apply as the Holy spirit blesses it. And also a, big part of it is discipleship and not even just discipleship like you have one person mentoring you but rather this kind of community of always being in conversation about the scriptures with people that know you and love you where y'all are drawing out applications together i i think that's like a, a underrated like form of like bible study but the holy spirit <laughs> like we we need him like he inspired the bible And so we need his help to understand the Bible. And I think one thing that ministers to me is these two stories where you have Jesus, where he is, it's after he has died and resurrected and he is walking with the disciples and the text says that he opens up their minds to understand what he's saying. When he says that like the prophets in the Old Testament, they were talking about me, but then you have Paul where he is teaching and the Bible says the Lord opened up Lydia's mind to understand. Like we, we, like we need him to open it up, but we also need him to apply it. So, for example, I, I just want to be practical. So this week I've been reading through First Peter. First Peter, some of those passages don't don't directly resonate with me. And so it makes me want to move on. It's mm-hmm. like, ah, oh, let me read a psalm or, ah, oh, let me read something intellectually engaging. Like, OK, like, you know he uh what does it say like he he blessed us and like we're going to have all these trials and all this stuff. And I was like, Lord please apply this word to my heart. That was the prayer. Like, mm-hmm. even if, like, I can read the commentaries and all the things, but apply it to my heart. Make it make sense, right? And in, when that happens, the Holy Spirit will draw out one word. Like, you will be grieved with various trials if necessary. Huh. Everything that I'm going through that's difficult and hard and challenging All of it, if it's happening to me, the sovereign God must deem it necessary. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how we like, we read the word and it becomes alive is that we entrust it, like we entrust ourselves and we entrust our study and we entrust our thinking to the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in his word. And so I think sometimes we trust our intellect too much. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I studied it and I parsed it out and I exposited and I exegeted. And it's like, that's cool. You know how many people that know how to exegete the word and don't, not, don't live it, mm-hmm. don't love it, don't have an affection for it. Like we need the Holy Spirit to do that work in us. And so that's, that's number one, trust yeah. the Holy Spirit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole point. That. You have a you have a number two, or we're we gonna just number one was good enough to stay with, yeah. unless you have got a number two to add to it. Yeah, Holy Spirit, prayer, community, yeah. and mm-hmm. patience. Mm-hmm. Patience is huge. I think social media is making us very impatient readers of the Bible, where we expect to understand everything immediately, and that's yeah. just not how it works. Mm-hmm. You got a book that's written thousands of years ago. 
with all these different genres, all these different perceptions. Like John's purpose is different than Matthew's purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which we have to be patient with the book and meditate on the book. I remember reading somewhere where Spurgeon said like, he'll read a passage and then he he allows the day to become the commentary. And I, I really started to apply that, like what would it look like to read a passage and then to allow the day to be a form of meditation on said passage? Mm -hmm. I think when you live that way, it'll open up the text in a way um, that makes it understandable just throughout time. Like we mm -hmm. need to, we, and that's a part of, sorry for rambling, that's a part of walking by the spirit as we read his word, because what is one fruit of the spirit? Like patience forbearance yeah. like like the holy spirit will develop certain ideas out but you have to sit with it mm -hmm. and be okay with that it sounds like you know there's a danger of not reading enough scripture but there could be a danger of reading too much scripture like mm. even on mm -hmm. the bible through the year one of the reasons i don't do it every year is because i feel at some level like i'm rushing through it and mm -hmm. the examples that you gave or even what spurgeon what you quoted from him sounds mm -hmm. like sometimes we just need to sit on a few yeah. verses and yeah. instead of moving on. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if some of that is contingent on the season of life you are in. And so I think a newer be believer, I would counsel them to read the whole thing mm -hmm. so that if they met, like you kind of need to see the forest to understand the trees sometimes. Um, but I think as a person progresses through the Christian life and they have, they got some knowledge of the word, then there's more room for them to meditate on the little things because they already have a concept of the big picture. Mm -hmm. Well, God has really given you a platform to speak mm. to this generation and they're listening, even though you say mm. hard things. Yeah. So what is your passion? Like if you were to just kind of give a charge to those who are listening right now about going deeper with the Lord and taking their Christianity more seriously, what would you tell them? He's worth it. Yeah, he's worth it. I think um, Christianity is difficult. It is hard, but it's also joyful. And I get that from First Peter, <laughs> where he says, you, you're going to go through various trials that are grievous. Like, you will grieve but in this you rejoice right that there like that there is coming a day when jesus will be revealed in the hope he's a living hope right and so like you're not wasting your time to love god you're, you're not wasting your time to try to to be present in your local community you're not wasting your time to break up with this person because they're leading you into sin like you're not wasting your time if god is real if jesus is lord and if he is coming back and will be revealed one day, it is worth loving someone that you cannot see and believing someone that you cannot see because one day we gonna see him. And I think I think that will make everything make sense when we do. So that's what I would say is, I think that's my heart is that I want people to believe that God is worthy in the teaching and the preaching and the captions and the posts. I don't want you to just know him. I want you to have an affection for him. I want your heart to burn when you hear him because <laughs> he's, he's good. He really is.